Alright, time for a video on Fantasy Races, Attraction, and You. Which, now that I've said that out loud, makes it sound like a 1960s instructional video on interspecies dating, but whatever. I'm sure most of you know the basics of these fantasy races, you've seen them in many other games. Humans are varied, orcs are strong, elves have unhealthy obsessions with wildlife, but in game terms, who do you want and how do you get them? I'll head over to the wiki here, which lists almost every possible character in the game, divided up into lists by fantasy race, which will make this video really easy to break into pieces. It also has a list of every possible building attraction potential. I'll be sure to link both in the video description for your easy viewing. There are a few exceptions to attractions, the Dwarven Wilbur Wilbert here for example, but as a general rule, if it's on this page and has an attraction building material, you can get lucky and spike one for your town. Let's start with the humans, the most varied of the races, and the only one I won't be able to fit the entire list on screen at the same time. Getting new humans is very easy. Some join via event, you can attract children who will grow into humans, or you can attract humans directly by building any building with either food or moonstone as a building material, which is an option on every building other than the archery range or herbalist hut. As humans are widely varied and prolific throughout the game, I'll mention each one. Going down the list. Warriors will be your primary early game combat class until you find stronger individuals. In the late game, they still hold some value, as their ability to hold two-handed swords in one hand makes them decent tanks, and a long-lived warrior also tends to have one of the game's best tactical ratings, which is a pretty good skill to have. You'll want to not lose the couple you start with, maybe take one or two more with an early barracks buff, but don't go too wild on these guys. Gatherers specialize in gathering. They tend to be bad in any challenge other than hunting, but gathering is one of the game's most important skills overall, and there aren't many other options who are as good as a human gatherer is. You'll definitely want to get a manger up so that new gatherers start with bonus skill points, and it's hard to go wrong with turning any new children into gatherers. Even if you think you already have enough, you can always double them as a sacrificial meat shield. Craftsmen are your early game crafters and they try to make a name for themselves in non-combat challenges by also having a wide range of other skills. The wiki description here makes it sound like they specialize in a bunch of different things, but generally speaking, any given crafter will trend to just a few of these, which means any given crafter can end up as a local powerhouse or spread so thin they are just filler. Also, unlike gatherers, there are several other, better options for crafters available over the course of a game. The ones you start with will probably become decent by virtue of getting a lot of levels, but I wouldn't go getting any more of them if you can avoid it. Hunters are the human equivalent of a utility class, as their skill distribution seems to make them just fine in any challenge, frontline, or support. Sadly, this also tends to result in them watering down, resulting in a fine early game unit, but petering off late game unless they get really lucky with their levels. That said, dexterity is good, perception is good, and having a hunter in your group can trigger certain alternate options in encounters. I'd recommend having one per group. Medics are, let's face it, not great combatants. Intelligence and will makes them great non-fight individuals, but they usually have such paltry strength that they will struggle to be able to lift the shirt on their backs, making it hard to gear them for success. However, it's hard to overstate how useful the medic's skill is in this game, especially combined with Bloodbath, so I try to have one present in every group I run, unless I end up with some other guy with a huge medic skill and higher strength. Witch and Sage the game considers these close enough to the same class to use the same icon, but their growths do tend to differ somewhat, with witches generally being more useful thanks to magic. Still, much like the medic, they are poor in direct fights, but much better in non-combat ones, and can sometimes trigger alternate encounter options. So, having one of these per group is a good plan. Bandits are basically warriors who traded their two-handed sword special ability for extra stealth. 
There's no guarantee that you'll ever get one, so if you find one early on, they might become decent by virtue of all the leveling they get. But if one shows up late, he's basically just a worse version of any other number of direct combatants. A Scholar is basically a Sage on steroids. Somewhat rare to get one, but if you do, be sure not to waste his talents sitting in town. Get him in the field, preferably standing behind a few layers of warrior. Inventors are rare. The building that unlocks them is the same as the building that unlocks Scholars and Sages, but unlike Sages, Scholars and Inventors aren't guaranteed options. The Meeting Hall just gives you a chance at one at Child Growth. But should you get the chance to take an Inventor, you definitely should, as he has arguably the game's best crafter. And even if you prefer the Dwarven Smith, the Inventor's other stats are so high he can single-handedly win most non-fight challenges, and even be fairly decent in fights as well. You can make a case for putting him both in an adventuring party for the fights, or sit him in town and build like so many things. Scavengers are not great. The only thing I have to say about this guy is I think he opens up a few encounter options, and that if he lucks out at level up, he might become a gatherer who is slightly better at combat. But if you never see one of these, don't lose any sleep over it. With the humans out of the way, let's do the rest of the guys, top to bottom, starting at the beasts. Beasts are incredibly easy to get if desired, as buildings made with clay, sandstone, or monster bone will do the job, with the monster bone option having a really silly high modifier. Also, the manger has a tracked beast as one of its standard functions, so making it out of anything will also work. Beasts have a big downside, and that's that they cannot wear anything but accessories. They may be good at whatever they're good at, but you won't be able to augment them too much, especially in direct fights where armor and a weapon would help. But some beasts don't really need it. The abilities of beasts vary wildly, which is why, if you want beasts, you will want a huge attraction value for them, so that you can churn through all the scrub lords, using them as sacrificial meat shields, or sent out on suicide scouting expeditions, while you wait for the one that is worth keeping. And which are those? The Queen Bee, Strigabat, and Royal Crow fit their niches real well, as does the Dragon Spider, who I had the good fortune to get a hold of in my sample playthrough. Also, the Boar, Bear, and Alpha Wolf can fit in early to mid-game team effectively, and when you get to late game, you can seamlessly slide them to a position of escort for a gathering team or town defense to make room for more powerful people in your main group. I mean, if you're using the combat group size difficulty option, otherwise just put everyone in. All the other beasts range somewhere from meh to bleh, but again, always useful as, we'll call them shock troops. Next, let's scroll to the second biggest list, the demons. You can attract demons by making buildings out of dragon or enchanted bones, and have a nice wide variety of buildings you can make to do so. Demons fall over a range of potential from fairly bad, to very reasonable, to apparently so powerful it would break the wiki to show it. Seriously, if anyone knows what character this line is supposed to represent, please post in the comments. Also, there is a missing line about here. The... This? Which I have no idea how to pronounce, so I'm going with Smock, who is basically the demon equivalent of the Strigabat. Unlike Beasts, which is a lot of meh with a few good options, demons are a lot better overall. You will rarely have a demon join your group and be disappointed by it. Doesn't hurt to have any demon in your group either, never know what events might have an option for it. Here we have the dwarves. Build a building with gold, and you have a chance at seeing them arrive. Though it tends to be hard to get dwarves, since even the most gold-centric buildings can only top out at an attract rating of 2. Take any dwarf, and you can basically call them like the human X, but way better. The smith being, depending on your point of view, the best crafter in the game, the warrior being effectively the strongest fighter outside of the mythical category, and the bandit honestly may as well be another dwarf warrior. When you start hitting strength ratings of 40, the difference of a couple points becomes academic. Dwarves are always good to get, the only real thing holding them back is the poor attraction potential. But if you have gold handy, and not much else, building a town of mostly gold is perfectly reasonable. 
Below the dwarves are the elves. Attraction is based on buildings made of elven wood, though much like the dwarves above, it tends to be difficult, since even the most elven woody of a building has an attraction of two. All elves get pierce, meaning they all get the first strike ability naturally, so long as you don't override it by equipping them with a hammer. Also, even the weakest elves tend to have enough strength to wear whatever you want them to, so while elves may not have the strength of dwarves or orcs, they are still, usually, stronger than humans, and can make up the damage difference between them and stronger races by getting to first strike with the game's biggest damage weapon, the two-handed axe. Also, three of the four elves here tend to have an impressive magical stat, and even the fourth one, the regular forest elf, might end up with magic too. So if you are looking for magic to add to your party, going for a lot of elvage is one way to do it. Which brings up this event here, the Cursed Elf Event. This is a mid to late game event that can just happen randomly, as well as happen over and over again. And if you have three party members with two or more magic each, you will be given a Hex Challenge option to break his curse. If you succeed, he joins you. He is by far the strongest of all the elf choices with decent magic to boot, and the Hex Challenge is pretty darn simple to beat so you might not even need elven wood buildings to boost your elf population in a long enough game. Just make sure you have a team with magic handy and run into this guy's event a half dozen times. Next in line is ghosts, and there is no attract ghost option, so if you want these, you'll have to find them elsewhere. Though you might have a child, uh, grow up into a child wraith. Some of these can be quite good. Others tend to fall with low tier beasts in the what do I feel like sacrificing column. But they all have one thing in common, they are all ghosts. Which means they all trigger any event that requires a ghost in the party. One of those events happens to be quite significant. Towards the end of the game, you might have that event where you are set upon by shades and giants. There are several ways to handle this encounter, but if you end up having to use the direct fight, it has a challenge rating of something like 1738 skulls. But one other option is to have a ghost handy. Now granted, one could argue that your main adventuring party should be able to handle itself anyway, otherwise you weren't ready to survive the endgame. But I would respond to that in two ways. One, don't tell me how to play you stuck-up, half-witted, scruffy-looking nerf herder. And two, that may be true for your main party, but a gathering team can also be jumped by this event and are probably far less likely to be able to handle it normally. One ghost with them, no problems. How about goblins? Well, you can get them through using Darkwood or Obsidian in your buildings, and you can ramp that attraction up pretty high with the Obsidian option. But how useful are they? Human Hunter, Human Hunter, Human Warrior, this one may as well be a witch, these guys are very human-like. Their base stats tend to be higher than a human's base stats, but by the time you have a lot of obsidian-made buildings, your humans probably have put a lot of levels under their belt. Still, given the huge attraction you can build for goblins, you may very well be able to augment your leveled humans with an army of slightly better humans. And that's not altogether a bad thing. If you have an easy source of obsidian, by all means, you could do worse. Mythical. There is no attract mythical, so don't get your hopes up. And most of these are unique creatures that you can only get by finishing a mean quest line. By which point, it's not like you really need more people, the game's already over, and you've won. The Shade can occasionally be gotten in this event, and I actually have one in my playthrough. Here it is. It's strong, but also very late to the party. Basically, Mythical is the cosmetic reward of this game. Looks nice, but doesn't affect gameplay much. At least these don't require you to pay for a microtransaction. Orcs! Orcs can be attracted by building buildings with steel. They are also tied with dwarves as the hardest race to attract due to a lack of building options that you can use steel in. It's actually exactly the same building options as the dwarves and their gold. And also like the dwarves, there are only four orc types. But what about their usefulness? Are they worth it? My answer to that is, only if you have steel and nothing else as a mid-tier building material. The reason is, while orcs are super high strength, 
These two right here, the fighter and worker, can be gotten through alternate means. Just like the cursed elf event I mentioned above, the orcs have an event that can occur repeatedly that allows you to get some orcs, provided you succeed in the event, which is almost trivial by the point in the game it can start appearing, as long as you don't forget to give your guys gathering tools. Post-event, you'll get a guaranteed option of giving up one of your party for a powerful orc warrior, which is almost always a worthwhile trade. And if you decline the trade, there's about a 1 in 3 chance the orc group will insist you take one of their workers instead, without you having to give up anyone for it. The orc worker is on par with the human gatherer as far as gathering goes, about on par with a human crafter as far as crafting goes, and has pretty high strength, what with being an Orcanol. So if you get this event, you can guarantee getting a great warrior for a cost, or take a chance at getting a great gatherer at no cost. I said it's almost always worth taking the Orc Warrior, because the party member you lose is randomly chosen. Even if you would like an extra Orc Warrior, you may not want to risk it if your current party has a lot of powerful guys in it already. And at the very bottom, Trolls and Undead, who between them only apparently have three types of unit. This is actually missing some people in the lists here, but it's a fan wiki, so you get what you pay for and all that. There's no attraction, and the events to get them are rather rare and sparse, so good luck getting a hold of these. That said, none of them are too bad. The Rocker is basically a boar. Stronger, but if you have a boar, it probably also got a fair number of levels before the rocker events showed up. And these two undead are fairly good. Not sure I'd take them over an elf wanderer, but I certainly wouldn't turn down one if offered. So, having gone through the races list, let me fade to this building list here so that I can say one more thing. I said back in the Towns and Parties video that buildings can have three effects. A primary numerical one, an ancillary one, and various race attraction values. Now time for a bit of strategy. When deciding which buildings to build, you may wish to focus less on the numerical effects and more on the ancillary and attraction values, especially in the early game. You can always demolish and rebuild a building with different materials later in the game for different buffs. But the sooner you get your characters into your party, the better those characters will be in the long run. So starting out, take a look at what materials you will have available to you, figure out which human classes or other races you can get a hold of using those materials, and put up buildings to support that goal as soon as possible. Once you have enough characters to fill a far-roaming adventuring party and properly defend your town, then you should consider rebuilding your town for its numerical bonuses. So, how about I wrap up this video by answering the question I asked at the beginning. What do you want? The answer is, as I'm guessing you gathered, that it depends. What buildings you choose to focus on for attraction is almost entirely going to be based on what attraction-based resources you have access to. However, let's play a hypothetical game of, I have all the resources I could want, what do I choose? And for the sake of this question, let's assume the option to build only one building of each type is on. I would say the answer comes down to how big your already existing population is. If you are in need of decent manpower quickly, I would go with the goblins. They are better than most humans and beasts, and easy to get total attraction values into the 30s. If you have a large population and are now looking for quality over quantity, I would make a golden palisade and meeting hall for the dwarves, and then lean hard on the demons. Dwarves are just that powerful, and while there are some bad demons, most of them are pretty decent and also reasonable choices to supplement your magic with. And with that, this video comes to a close. See you in the next one, or I put some clothes on. Uh, my characters. Put some clothes on my characters. Explaining that didn't make it sound any better, did it?